Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco. Coming up, I go off grid again, a new hard use American folder, and five late to the party knife reviews. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. By now you know the shocking details leading to the tragic death of knife design virtuoso Elijah Isham. He was 27. His singular talent and one-of-a-kind personality put him at the vanguard of the knife industry, creating knives that brought the exotic and sublime to the average knife lover's pocket. I only met Elijah once on an early podcast here, but he left an impression, not only of a warm, affable guy, but of a true artist with all the imagination, toil, doubt, and struggle that comes with the role. Jim and I joined the greater knife community in mourning the loss of Elijah's vision, potential, and friendship, and extend our deepest condolences to family and friends left behind. Now, on a lighter note, uh, let me bring to you my favorite comment of the week. Uh, now, this one uh, actually made me laugh out loud, and it, ha- it gave me a little personal connection. Uh, it- it's from IB Me, and he commented, automatic knife close-up. That's how I labeled my uh, LUDT video. It's an automatic knife close-up. It's a close-up video on an automatic knife. But I think perhaps the way I wrote it led to some confusion. He said, automatic knife close-up, LOL. I was waiting to see this knife automatically close. I guess I'm just a little bit slow, he says. And the thing that makes me laugh about this is uh, uh, when my wife and I were uh, first had our eyes on each other. This was back in the day when you still uh, wrote letters and and, uh, handwritten notes. And uh, she gave me a handwritten note and she signed it, think of me of 10. And then she said her name, think of me of 10. And for a long time, this vexed me because we weren't in regular uh, communication. Think of me of 10. What the hell does that mean? And then one day I realized often it means often. Think of me often. And uh, so this L-U-D-T, I, I be me comment brought me right back to my courtship days and uh, how it's just funny man you you read something and it could be obvious to the person who writes it and the person who's reading it is just somewhere else Uh, so maybe i'll take a look at how people actually write the word close up is it hyphenated is it all one word that always kind of vexes me too so uh thanks for the comment i be me and uh it's it's making me do a little bit of self-examination so i appreciate that uh now a pocket check Uh, Today, I'm carrying something that you've seen me talk about. Uh, You saw the unboxing. You saw me talk about it on Thursday Night Knives. I've been carrying it nonstop. I love it. This thing uh, was 100% off my radar, as was the company, until Naf Sargent uh, made a video on this knife. And uh, in his video, he implied that uh, the holy trinity of Strider, um, Hinderer, and Chris Reeve knives, has, and he also included Spartan, which I would too, has a new stable mate in this knife here this is the resco instruments gooseworks gooseworks is the knife wing of resco instruments uh mdcf mdcf stands for mekong delta combat folder and as far as i know uh the designer of this uh is a vietnam veteran and a frogman uh that's what they called seals back in the day and uh, designed this knife Resco Instruments is a watch company. It's kind of a, I'm not sure if you would call it boutique, but it's a small, um, a small watchmaker that makes, uh, um, maybe they're not that small, but they make some really cool dive watches. If you're into that uh, kind of thing, dive watches, uh, you know, tactical guy watches, what can I say? Uh, the kind of thing that a Navy SEAL wants to strap on his wrist when he jumps in the water, I guess. Uh, but they also started making folders this is their second one their first one um is a clip point blade with a fuller and it has five finger grooves that you're you know i've never held that one and uh it's not as sophisticated a design as this this mekong delta combat folder is just man it this really is uh, folder perfection for me. This is right up there with my Sabenza 21 and my XM18s and my Spartan Harzi uh, folder. 
it actually feels like a combination between the Spartan Harzi folder and the Sabenza. Uh, it has that blasted titanium finish of a Sabenza, um, and it's got the glassy smooth washer action. Oh, it's so it's a pleasure to open and close. I love this knife. Uh, we talked last week on Thursday Night Knives. The topic was how important really is action, and this is this is the knife that made me think of that because. This is, uh, you know, doesn't drop shut. That's for damn sure. It takes it takes pressure on your finger to very smoothly guide that blade back home. And I, I I've always loved that feel. Uh, I I am, you know, in, in in recent years have fallen also for the fall shut thing. I like that too. That's gratifying. Uh, but this just feels incredibly solid. And uh, this will not appear in the state of the collection uh, today because it's appeared. Uh, in states of the collection elsewhere for over a week now but um since i'm carrying it i thought i would i would uh, show it off on the supplemental and talk about it a little bit uh, that's 20 cv steel you can see their their diver man logo there it's a it's a guy a scuba scuba diver got a, a thumb disc um the the one that nav sergeant showed off had a hollow grind this is a flat grind comes to a pretty obtuse behind the edge geometry but it's so wickedly sharp so the geometry of this reminds me of um of my socoms uh kind of kind of coming in at a steep angle uh but somehow they get the edge i mean they get the edge wickedly sharp and and behind the edge just thin enough to be slicey um though this is not like a cheese cutter or, or an apple slicer. Uh, but uh, great looks. Uh, people have commented on how the pivot reminds them of John Gray. Uh, I have commented numerous times on how it reminds me, uh, the handle reminds me of the classic Emerson Specwar Viper 5, which was later interpreted by Zero Tolerance into the 0640. Just the, uh, just the plan form of the handle reminds me a bit of that. But, you know, a knife is a knife in, in a lot of ways. And, uh, Man, I love this one. So this is a four-inch blade, and uh, it has been riding, riding in my in my front right pocket for over a week now. You know that's dedication. You know that that's true love. Uh, something else that's been riding in my pocket uh, ever since I got it, uh, though that's been slightly less, is the new um, Jack Wolf Knives Laid Back Jack, and I got this one. Uh, thank you, Ben Belkin. He sent this to me. I did not uh, purchase this. This is not, uh, let me see. It is not dropped yet. Just checking the date. Uh, but he sent this to me to check out and, uh, and to have, and I appreciate that so immensely. Uh, this one is in black micarta. As you can see, it's starting to take on some of my funk and patina there. I love that. That, uh, M390 blade again, like the sharpshooter Jack before it is, full height hollow grind wickedly sharp and uh you know incredible walk and talk on this as uh as was the other one and that you know ben belkin is a connoisseur of custom um slip joint knives and so so much work went into these things i mean he he basically documented the journey on uh, thursday night knives for for a long time you know he would come on and, and talk about the the process of this and he is a stickler and it comes out in the knife. You know, sometimes when you're doing a job, you know, if I'm doing a job where I'm editing video or something and someone comes in and has uh, changes and stuff, it can it can really feel like, ah, this was good enough. This was a pain in the ass. And and then the change they suggest actually is great. And, oh, they know what they're doing. That's right. This is their project. I'm just the tool putting it together. <laughs> Uh, I haven't put it that way in my head before, but um, that's the same thing with Ben. Ben, you know, keep going back to the companies about the prototypes and saying, yeah, it's good, but the walk and talk and this and that, and we got to do this. And, you know, so that a lot of redesigns with this, a lot of moving from company to company until he landed in the absolute right spot. And he's not allowed to uh, disclose who that is, what company that is uh, contractually. Uh, but uh, man, they're doing an amazing job. Who knows? Uh, it, it almost doesn't matter to me. It's a Jack Wolf knife. And uh, <laughs> I love it. Uh, keep your eyes out for monthly drops of the Jack Wolf knives uh, for the first six months, uh, which started in April. 
and then there will be a period of uh, making new ones and, and that kind of thing. But you can check out all of his designs at jackwolfknives.com. Also, check out my most recent podcast with him because he's been on two shows. Um, uh, it's number 308, and it's great. It's right before his first knife dropped to the public and man it was it was great to talk to him you could you could sense the excitement and pure exhaustion uh, that had built up to that moment uh, not not just designing one knife and having it made he just started an entire company with everything uh, soup to nuts right from the start so an exhausted man and uh, we are all grateful for his efforts because he's churning out some not churning out he is creating some outstandingly beautiful modern slip joint folders this again also uh, in titanium. All right. Uh, last up today, it was a large fixed blade carry for me, but I somehow made it work. Uh, well, I know it was the choice of shirt that made this work. This is my Spyderco Street Bowie. I'm showing it in the sheath uh, as I do with all fixed blade knives because that is a huge part of the of of the recipe here. Uh, this knife, I thought I was going to resheath when I got it. I was like, why do they have to go so big with these pancake sheaths? Uh, but it and and. It rattles a little, but actually, this mostly doesn't get carried out and about. This mostly gets carried at home. This is a great sweatpants or 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 workout pants or pajama pant knife, I got to say, because uh, it's light and it draws easily. That's why I don't mind the rattle, because if I'm if I'm wearing this in gym shorts and just, you know, milling about the house and I need to draw it or or have to draw it, it doesn't take a lot of pressure. It's not going to pull my shorts up and give me a wedgie and all of that. It's just uh, it's just enough to hold the knife and to hold it upside down. And you can even shake it upside down. Uh, but when you pull it, it's not going to give you too much resistance. This Street Bowie, uh, one of my favorites. I love this knife. And, uh, and I'm enthralled by its designer, Fred Perrin, uh, certified French badass and and just a knife fighter. And I think he was in the French Foreign Legion and he was a French commando and the whole nine yards. Very cool, cool dude uh, and designs and also hand makes knives that are very similar to this often. They often are in this format. And this is kind of a bowied version of a traditional French fighting knife, French fighting knives and French chef's knives kind of evolved uh, um, in in parallel in parallel and oftentimes uh, what's considered a french fighting knife or a french kind of bowie knife quote unquote uh, looks like a um, chef's knife which i think is uh, i don't know there's some po poetry there because they have such a love and mastery of food and cooking that it makes sense that other implements you know knives for other uses would also echo that uh, instinct uh, this to me uh, is is a beauty because of the Bowie shaped blade and the fact that you have a full finger guard here without having a finger guard. It's like uh, the art of fighting without fighting. You have this big finger groove in here, and this this sort of guard area echoes that uh, cooking knife sort of thing. Uh, also, think of a knife like the Topps Prather War Bowie. It has uh, the blade there to stop you from moving forward if you're thrusting. This has a five inch blade. This is VG10 coated. Uh, there's a little bit of a rubberized section in the, in the middle. That's why I said the shirt means a, a lot if you wanna carry this under a shirt. Uh, nothing too textured. Uh, it will grab onto this and print, and be, just not feel good. Uh, have this uh, paracord on there for, for quick deployment if need be. Um, that's just for fun. And uh, yeah, this is what I carry today. The Resco Instruments Mekong Delta combat folder, the Jack Wolf knives laid back jack, um, sway back slip joint, and the Fred Perrin designed Spider Co. Street Bowie. Just such a cool, cool knife. Uh, also, this thing comes uncoated in uh, VG10, but has a shorter blade and um, shorter blade oh and and uncoated so there are a lot that's called the street beat and i had someone beat me up for accidentally calling this the street beat uh in the comments once all right so i wanted to show you before we move on to life knife news i wanted to show you what we're going to be giving away this month for the gentleman junkie knife giveaway uh and just so you know uh well this this is a a dave gift a gift from this old sword blade reviews he has sent me another box full 
of giveaway knives. And, and I'm just trying to wrap around all of the knives, knives he sent me and how and when I'm going to give them away. Uh, some of them are for gentleman junkie. Some of them are not. So uh, this is a gentleman junkie knife giveaway knife. This comes in this uh, nice pouch, which you might actually not carry the knife that comes in it in. You might uh, you might choose to put a Leatherman or something, but comes in this pouch. It's the Shielden Boa. Shielden is one of those relatively new manufacturers creating um, high value, extremely high quality folders. This is Contour G10. It's uh, sort of a jungle G10 with with uh, gray tan and uh, dark olive drab. And it's contoured uh, this way. So it's nice and comfy in the hand. Um, it's got some jimping flourishes here. And then when you open it, it has a nearly four inch. What is this? Yeah, just about four inch uh, blade of D2 and that really cool uh, clip point Tonto. Clip point Tonto. That's what I'm going with. Um, a great knife for uh, work. You've, you've, if you hold it in this sort of uh, forward pull cut grip, it, it presents that secondary edge at a great angle. You can easily use just the tip or you can use that entire here. I'm going to use this line as an example. You can use that entire length of blade and it's just at a super comfortable angle. Um, great action on this bearings. This is what we've come to expect. You know, when you get when you get something now that's 60 bucks and doesn't have awesome action, it's kind of like. Well, what are you doing? Uh, uh, what have you been doing all day? Everyone else is coming out with this thing. So, uh, so here it is, the Shielden Boa. Uh, I've been, uh, I've had this one for a little while, and uh, I was mentioning on Thursday Night Knives how it's been sitting on my shelf, my temporary ownership shelf, meaning like people who loan me things, uh, own, loan me knives or knives that I'm selling or something like that, uh, are over on that shelf. And this one gets. Um, I don't want to say picked up because I don't want people to think I've used it because I haven't. But this one has been a hard one not to just somehow it made its way into my collection. Uh, you can Spidey flick it using that opening hole. And uh, wh whoever gets this will be a lucky gentleman junkie. So uh, check in on May 19th. That's a Thursday night at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard right here live on YouTube, Facebook or, or Twitch. And, uh, and we will give that knife to a lucky patron. Uh, Jim puts up a really cool wheel. We spin it and it randomly selects someone. It's a lot of fun. So how do you do that? How do you get involved in that? You go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and sign up for one of the uh, tiers of support. Easy to do, quick, and you get, a, you get a lot of extra stuff and exclusive content. So check that out. Quickest way, knifejunkie.com slash Patreon or scan the code here. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Looking for a new knife? How about one from Benchmade? Spiderco, We, or Bark River? Get that new knife and support the Knife Junkie channel, and save money on a new knife all at the same time. Visit our Knives for Sale page at www.thenifejunkie.com slash knives for this week's specials. Through our affiliate relationships, we bring you weekly knife specials on great knives. You save some money on your knife purchase, and the Knife Junkie channel makes a small commission, it's a win-win. Check out the new knife specials each and every week at www.thenifejunkie.com slash knives. That's thenifejunkie.com slash knives. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Uh, one company that we're all very happy jumped into knife making. We were talking about Resco Instruments, the watchmaker. Uh, well, another one that we're very happy got into knife making is Hogue. Hogue, who for 50 years was making gun grips and other sort of gun accessories. I think it's about a dozen years ago now started making knives under their under their label. Uh, they enlisted Alan Alishowitz and others. And man, they've just been killing it ever since. And in in my estimation, I think that they make the best axis style lock out there. Uh, but that's just, uh, that's just this commentator's opinion. Um, they have a new line of automatics out, which is exciting to me I, uh, because it's breaking the mold a little bit. They look different from the other Hogs, and I'm excited about them. Uh, they're, it's called the Ballista line, the Ballista line. And, uh, <laughs> my wife's roller derby name used to be, uh, used to have ballistic in it and uh 
and I think she would like this because you cannot say that word without her going off. So uh, anyway, the ballista line, it's a, a two piece aluminum handle. You got a, a button actuator and a, a secondary lock, which I, I never really go for um, on a really nicely milled aluminum handle. It's giving you just enough kind of milling to make it uh, grippy, but not enough to tear up your your seams there. Uh, it comes in a really nice 154 cm either Tonto blade or uh, there's a drop point blade on in this in this one right there. Yeah, thanks, Jim. That to me looks so much like what does that look like to you? Yes, it looks like an SNG to me. I saw that and I double taked I, I double took. I double took and I thought, uh, is this the uh, is this the um, uh, ProTech SNG? I mean, to me, that looks just like the ProTech SNG. Uh, but in any case, a very and I'm only talking about the blade. If you're listening, I'm only talking about the drop point ballista blade. Uh, the handle looks nothing like the SNG, but just in this photograph, they isolate only the blade. Um, and I'm not saying that it's derivative or a ripoff. I'm just saying that's what it made me think of. Uh, excellent blade shape for sure. Uh, they they give you that uh, sharpening notch rather far up, uh, but I think they want to make that choil as useful and safe as possible. And when you back the edge up to a choil, all the way up to the choil cleanly without a little notch there. Uh, you know, people, those who have big sausage fingers and are, are, are using that choil and, and really bearing down uh, could stand to get cut in their finger. So I get it. But uh, yeah, I love the look of this Tonto 154 CM. Again, a great steal. I love it. Uh, Hogue just just makes awesome knives. And I love uh, that they're going aluminum with these. Um, who doesn't love aluminum? I do. I have an aluminum, uh, <laughs> sorry, a little, I have an aluminum, uh, launch nine on my keychain that has worn in so beautifully. You've all been on the journey with me because I show it off every once in a while. I love the way the keys have worn down, uh, the anodizing on that aluminum. Anyway, that's what you have to look forward to. If you get one of these new ballistic, uh, ballista, uh, model hoags that uh, new from, from Hogue. Oh, by the way, uh, it's that's a three and a half inch blade, if I didn't mention that, which now puts it right in my line, line of sight, because right here in our state on July one, I can now I will be able to walk around with an automatic. So you better believe my automatic ranks will swell uh, at that moment. All right. Next up. <sighs> Kershaw's product release number two just just bums me out, just like the lower third says, man, it bums me out because I've always loved Kershaw and ZT. They were, uh, when I expanded out from Cold Steel way back when, uh, they were one of the first ports in the storm. And uh, man, I just loved to, uh, actually the the folder, the storm was so amazing. A, a great folder that was designed by Ken Onion. I, I had to give it to a cop at LaGuardia Airport uh, rather than throw it away. He said, I can't accept that knife. You know, I was trying to, trying to get on the plane. I forgot I had it. And this was before 9-11. He's like, I can't accept, uh, he, he said, you can't get on there, but uh, I'll help you try and get your baggage. Baggage was already on the plane. He's like, well, you got to you gotta throw it out. And I'm like, um, well, I don't want to throw it out. Can I just give it to you? You're a cop. You'll, you could use this. And he's like, I can't accept it, but I could pick it up off the floor if I saw it. And so I put it on the floor gently. He picked it up. He's like, oh, look at this nice knife. And that was it. That was a Kershaw storm. I loved that thing. It was on me 24-7. Um, back, back, back in the day and, um, actually bought it in the, in a store in the DC area. Can't do that anymore. Those were the days of Kershaw that I love. And, uh, man, recently they've been, they've been putting these kind of things out. This is fine. I, I understand not everyone is a knife junkie. Some people just need a, a lock back folder with a, with a plastic handle. So they've come out with this one. You can scroll down, Jim. They came out with another one. That looks like it a little different. And then they came out with another one that's really annoying. This one right here, this Karambit, it's a um, it's a speed safe uh, assisted open Karambit. Just like at first blush, it's a good looking knife, but it doesn't make sense. Uh, first of all, it's uh, it's it's got the speed safe um, assisted open. It's set up for uh, tip. Oh, man. For edge 
up carry, which means when you pull it out, it's not oriented properly for karambit use. You have to flip it open first with the assisted open and then reorient it in your hand, put your finger through the loop to use it like a karambit. So it's just, to me, this is just a dangerous knife. It's something that someone will buy thinking, oh, this is a great self-defense knife. But in reality, to get it, to bring it to bear, you have to already have it in your hand. If you want to use it in any sort of situation, you have to have it out and open because it doesn't have a wave on it. I mean, I see that it you can switch the clip to the other side and make it a little more um, amenable. And maybe with those big giant pocket studs, maybe you could actually catch those pocket studs on the seam of your pant and actually use it like a wave. But I, I say that any folder, uh, any folding karambit, any folding karambit is going to be a self-defense tool. So any folding karambit needs to have some sort of wave on the blade, uh, some sort of hook that auto deploys the blade as you pull it from your pocket. Otherwise, it's a paperweight uh, and a dangerous one that can probably get you thrown in jail. So so this one uh, ruffles my feathers a little. Uh, the one below it, fine. You're a hunter. Get your get your get your desuches on or whatever that's being called. I don't mean to be disrespectful to Kershaw. I just think this stuff is just boring. Uh, but here is something cool. The Lucha. I love the Lucha. That's there. That's their highest end, uh, uh, or for them, quite high end, um, American made Bally Song. Um, I have the original one with the clip point blade. This is a new one coming out. It's got carbon fiber incorporated on it, making it much lighter, which uh, Bally Song guys might like. It's also got a very good looking spear point blade with an interesting swedge, uh, similar to the clip point, which had an interesting clip point shape with an interesting swedge. Otherwise, the quillions and the handle shapes and dimensions are all pretty much the same. This to me is exciting. Uh, they don't, mm, <laughs> I was about to say, they don't need to come out with all those other uh, knives, but you know, obviously <laughs> they do. That's their bread and butter. I guess they don't need to come out with all those knives for me. Uh, but I don't think they were doing that in the first place. Uh, this one also is uh, different from the original Lucha in that instead of 14C28N, which I which I do like a lot, uh, this one has 20CV, uh, which I like even better. So I'm sure it'll cost uh, a pretty penny more uh, due to that and the carbon fiber and the extra um, process in making it. Uh, but that is one of the Kershaw's. That is the Kershaw in this new product release that uh, is interesting to me that I look forward to checking out. All right, still to come on the Knife Junkie podcast, State of the Collection, we're going to take a look at a few new off-grid knives that have come into my hands. And then five late-to-the-party knife reviews. What, what does that mean, Bob? Well, you hear me say a lot that I'm late to the party on knives. Um, I'll get something that has been out uh, for a while, and I talk about how great it is. And, uh, and I imagine people who have already known that being like, yeah, Bob, yeah, we know, we know, we know all about the PM2, Bob. So uh, that's what, that's what we'll be doing. I got five knives uh, that have come across my desk, uh, a few of them that I own that I've always been interested in that I finally get a chance to check out right here on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. I've talked a lot about the off-grid knives Enforcer XL, a big brute of a knife. Some people call it a reverse Tonto. Clearly, it's a bellied Warncliffe. It's got a large a glass breaker, really gnarly handle, and it's a great, it's it's my car knife. Uh, it's my car folder. Uh, it's you know, it just seems like uh, for, for most situations, you're good to go. That one is in D2. Well, I've always been curious about the enforcer from which the XL sprang. And uh, Carrie Orifice of Off Grid Knives was kind enough to send this to me. This is the enforcer. And like it's a uh, big brother, the one that rides in my car, it's in D2 steel. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a, just a shrunk down version or the other one, the XL is an enlarged version of this. Everything about it is the same except for the size. And in this design, that works great. I find that uh, just expanding or contracting a design by a percentage doesn't always work. Didn't work with the Endura to the Delica, like they needed to change around the, the design of the handle to make it work. 
not so in this case. I would imagine that's a good way to design a knife because uh, you can you can save time and energy on design. Uh, I, I love this knife. I almost like it better than the XL, only because this is a very easy knife to carry. This is a, a three and a one quarter inch blade, by the way. Super sharp. Man, they do D2 right. They also do their coating right. The coating on all of their blades, no matter what the steel, always has a nice slippery feel to it. That's why I love cutting a cardboard with off-grid knives. I have not cut cardboard with this one. I think I only opened a meat package or something. I can see a little bit of salmonella at the tip of the blade here. Um, but the cool thing about this one also is that the peaks of the pyramids in that neur knurled texture in the G10 are knocked down. They're a little flattened. So they are not as abrasive as the XL. The XL, they don't knock down the peaks on these pyramids and they really are aggressive. And so on the large one, it works for me uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, in theory and in practice, it works to have that, that sharp knurling because that is an emergency knife for me. That is not something that I carry. It's something I keep in the car for emergencies and for fidgeting, I'll be honest. But uh, this is something that I could carry on a daily basis, and I've carried around the house since I've gotten it quite a bit. And so to have that knocked down, it's coming in and out of the pocket. It's just not as aggressive. It's not as destructive on your property. Um, so And, and that uh, heavy, uh, sharp peaking on the large ones also uh, make it make good glove knives. So this this is... A really cool knife. If it's made by Best Tech, like like all of the off grid knives now, they used to have an Elite series made by We. That Elite series is now made made by Best Tech, and to me personally, uh, I think that's a a good move because Best Tech is. I don't know. They might be my favorite OEM. I'm not saying uh, that they're better than anyone else, but they might be. Uh, pound for pound, my favorite OEM. And uh, so you can't go wrong with the build. So if you like the design, this thing is awesome and a little bit more manageable at three and a quarter inch. It's in that perfect um, that perfect size for most people's EDC. All right, next up, a limited edition of its big brother, the Enforcer XL. Um, this one is called the Red Dawn Edition. The Red Dawn edition. Who saw Red Dawn? Uh, I, I did. I grew up on Red Dawn in the 80s with uh, C. Thomas Howell and Patrick Swayze. And I think uh, Sex in the City was in it. Um, what's her name? Um, it's a great movie. You know, teenagers defending their hometown from Russian invaders. It was so cool. And then they did an update with Thor in, uh, I don't know, 2016 or so. Uh, Thor, and I can't remember who else was in it. It was going to be the Chinese invading, and then the Chinese had something to say about it. So it uh, it turned into the North Koreans. I think that was in post-production. Glad I wasn't the effects editor on that. Changing all those uniforms must have sucked. Uh, XL, Red Dawn. We know why. We can tell. Look at this. It's It's got this beautiful black G10 with uh, with ribbons and ropes of red shooting through it. So cool. When I looked at it, I was like, I, it looked almost like applique. And then when you turn it on the side, you can see it running through. Um, just beautiful. And then on this one, instead of D2 steel, you got your 154 CM. Uh, definite upgrade from D2. And one of my favorite steels. Um, uh, one of my uh, practical favorites for everyday use. Uh, all of my Emersons are 154 CM, except for my long lost... Um, Iron Dragon. Come on, Joe. Send back my Iron Dragon, Joe. You know who you are, Joe. Send it back. Uh, that one's in, in, in S35. So, yeah, I got real used to 154, and I love it. This is in 154. This has awesome action on bearings. That heavy blade helps it fall shut. This is not as smooth as my as my D2 version, but my D2 version uh, has has had quite a bit of break in i have found with off-grid knives they have an interesting break in period uh, um, which is like 10 flips you know unlike an emerson where you buy it uh and, and that's the only comparison here uh you buy it uh, you go through this tumultuous break in period where you think you made a mistake and then suddenly it blossoms into this amazing um young adult i mean uh, the knife 
and works great. These <laughs> off grids come smooth. And then after 10 flips, they're just stupid smooth. They're insanely smooth. Uh, so that's that's where this Enforcer XL Red Dawn Limited Edition is headed. Uh, go over to Off Grid Knives. Actually, go to theknifejunkie.com slash off grid. And it will take you to the off grid site. And if you buy anything there, I get a, a little affiliate bump. Um, this is one knife company that I happily and openly um, accept uh, an affiliate uh, sales link from because I love the knives. I have a big collection of them. And I think uh, I think Kerry's an awesome guy. And I think what he's doing, making these luxurious but super rugged knives um, at, at an affordable cost with cool designs, I think it's a uh, I think it's a, he's doing a great thing, great service for us knife junkies. Uh, last up is something that I've been waiting for and asked him about a long time ago. And and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people, he got a lot of feedback like this. Uh, but someone, uh, you know, someone's got to make this Cayman and XL. And Carrie's just the guy to do it. So here it is. It's the off-grid Cayman XL. The Cayman EDC is a great knife. Uh, I should have hold it out it's just across the room um, but it's a great knife with these dimensions these edc dimensions uh three and a quarter inches uh uh in blade length well this one he bumped it up to four inches and it is a beast now this is a knife that uh, through my own observation i am saying uh that he could not just in the design process say uh make this larger by five percent and have it work out because of the shape of the handle of the of the EDC version. It's um, uh, proportionately speaking, it is shorter and and fatter than this one. Not fatter in this direction, but wider in in the top to bottom dimension. And it fits great in hand, and it and your whole hand kind of encapsulates it, and it feels great. But if you were to to just take that and enlarge that whole thing by five percent or whatever percentage, it would be too wide. To actually grip onto so he had to elongate the handle and uh, do 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 a couple of changes to the handle to make it work at the four inch blade length so um he's a smart designer i think he's got uh he's got another design uh, oh the rhino he went from the rhino to the mini rhino i mean the micro rhino and so he went from a three and th uh three and three quarters inch blade down to a two and a half inch blade and the handle works perfectly. And all he had to do was shrink it down by a percentage. And somehow that large handle translates into a tiny handle perfectly. And that's by not uh, reducing the actual fatness of the of the handle. It all works out great. So I think Kerry's a very smart designer as well as uh, a designer of very compelling uh, hard use folding knives produced by Best Tech. I mean, look at this thing. Oh, wait, is that a scratch? No, it's not. Okay. I'd be fine with a scratch because... Uh, because I use my stuff, but uh, this is so new. I didn't want one. Um, great action on this. This is also like uh, following the the trend of it took about 10, 10 flips and now it's just glassy, ridiculous smooth. I love the big, broad caiman shaped blade. Caiman is a crocodilian animal from South America. This looks this blade shape looks like a crocodile. They have a long, slender snout. Um, the Cayman does. And this thing, man, I highly, highly recommend it. Go check out your off-grid knives. Go to the knifejunkie.com slash off-grid and uh, pick a few up. My dad has been uh, kind of uh, without any consultation from me or urging from me, uh, collecting a bit of off-grid knives here. And I don't even know if he's been using my affiliate link, so I have to make sure that he does. Dad, if you're watching slash listening, go to thenifejunkie.com slash off-grid to get your next off-grid knife. Thanks, Dad. All right, so that is the state of the collection. And uh, uh, what could have been included in it is the Resco Instruments, uh, Mekong Delta Combat Folder we went over uh, during the pocket check. And then a knife that's going to be coming up here in the five late to the party knife reviews. Let's get to those right now after this sip of black morning uh, wake up liquid. I brew some good coffee, I got to say. It's not like I didn't have training as a barista. Uh, we just didn't call it that back then. We called it a maker of coffee. All right. So of these five knives, these are all five knives that when they came out, uh, got a lot of uh, fanfare or interest from me. Two of them got some fanfare, 
but more interest from me due to their innovative designs. Uh, and we'll get to those innovations and see and see what I think about those in a minute. But first up is one that I know Jim has, and it's designed by a guest of the show. Richard Rogers. It is the CEO. Now, I came by this CEO through uh, Dave, this old sword blade reviews. I mentioned before he sent me a giant box of giveaway knives. This is one of them. And for a guy who calls himself the knife junkie, I'm a little surprised I hadn't actually experienced this in person yet. Um, the CEO is a really cool knife. This thing was created to be something you could put in your breast pocket of a dress shirt and it would look like a pen now it doesn't exactly it that that looks like a knife clip and not a pen clip and you know the top the top is a little it doesn't exactly look like a pen but to the to an unexamining eye you could easily get away with this and not for nothing probably no one's wearing it in their shirt pocket they're wearing it in their suit pants pocket and we all know that suits have very light fabric. Everything everything is light and flowy on a, on a on a pair of uh, suit pants. Unlike jeans, which are more rigid and can carry more weight. When you're wearing a pant, uh, when you're wearing dress slacks or a suit pant, you want something very light and thin. And this definitely definitely fits the bill. Uh, where it goes south, the only place it goes south to me is that it does not offer that uh, tip up carry experience. It's tip down only tip down. Uh, you know, only a couple knives, I'll accept it on. But it also gets in the way sometimes during deployment here. You have no choice but to embrace the clip. You kind of have to grab the clip up there and then you can flick it open. It flicks open really easily. It's got a great uh, detent tuned very, very nicely. Uh, this is, I believe, uh, this is the eight CR version, I believe. Um, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to check the box, uh, eight CR. And then a, a, an FRN that sort of looks like carbon fiber. Um, so in its original state, which is always sort of a proof of concept for a knife, you know, they're not going to just come out with a million variations if they don't think if, if people aren't buying them. But in its original state, it's cool. I like it like this. But it has come out in a number of different materials now with uh, uh, that I've liked much better. Different steels, different handle materials and such. But the overall design is a cool one in that it is so slender. It's so light and slender. and But you can bring a decent length blade to bear. That's three and a quarter, uh, right? One, two, three. Yeah, three and a quarter. You can bring a decent length blade to bear. Uh, it's sharp and it's kind of classy looking. I mean, you pull this out. Most people are not knife people and they might think, "Ooh, that's, you know, that's very gentlemanly. Uh, the clip, though, the clip still, I, I, I the clip was always kind of the, the, the fall fall down point for me because it really you have you're almost there in terms of having a package that could look like a pen in a breast pocket, you know, that people are looking at all the time. All you have to do is square off the top and change that clip make the the clip more like a pen clip something milled maybe um i know that they're going for a certain price point but but something less knife clip like would do this knife good uh like a doctor's knife it has a flat bottom which is kind of cool so you can crush up your pills like that and stir them in a, into a potion not that you're going to use this for that but um so I, I like this knife. I'm I'm glad it came out. I, I really like Richard Rogers, a cool guy and great designer and maker. And uh, it's cool to see. Oh man, I've said cool like 100 times in the last minute. It's great to see uh, one of his knives bring in a mailbox money. Let's be honest. You know, every time someone buys a CRKT CEO, Richard Rogers gets a little slice. And obviously he deserves it because he designed a really cool thing. Um, and uh, I, I give it a thumbs up. And this next one uh, does not, I, I cannot say that for. I'm going to, I'm going to take this off screen. And right here uh, is, I'm not really talking about the knife here. This is called the kicker. And I believe this was the first knife uh, for CJRB featuring this lock. It's called the recoil lock. And that's what I'm talking about here, the recoil lock. And in short, 
I find it to be a disaster. It's kind of an unnecessary innovation. It's one of those things that they're like, let's try this. And I respect the trying. Um, this would be a great case for market research like they do with Hollywood movies. You know, instead of just having faith in the script and in the director and stuff, they they focus group it. What do you think of this ending? Should we change the ending? What do you like? Do you like this character or should we fire her and send her into the abyss where actors never return from? Um, and they should have done that with this knife. What do you people think of this lock? Do we need this lock? Is it necessary? Uh, should we dump a bunch of machining and time and research and money into this lock? And uh, if they had asked me, I would have said, no, sir. No, sir and ma'am. Please don't. Uh, and just continue to make your other amazing CJRBs, one of which I will be getting to later. So this is not a dump on CJRB. I do respect the spirit of innovation that went into this. Now, what it is, is uh, a lock that has a similar action to an access lock or a ball lock, like in the Maddox, where you're grabbing the sides here, pulling back, and then letting the knife kind of return to the handle. It's in flipper format here. And so the detent is, uh, as far as I can tell, is how this lock uh, interacts with the tang. That, that is the detent. Um, so when it, when it opens, when you engage the flipper, it very lackadaisically comes out. It's kind of like, really? It's, I'm, uh, is my break over? Yeah, your break is over, buddy. Time to cut some stuff, or at least time to fidget. And if it's time to fidget, you can, you can reach, uh, you can get the top, it's jimped, and slide this thing back and, and whip it back in. But there's something about it that is very unsatisfying for a couple of reasons. First of all, this whole thing, this, this uh, slides back and releases the blade. It's all loose in there. Here, let's see if we can hear it. There's, there's so much play in that lock. And uh, so, so that's annoying. And then when you so when you grab that when you grab the lock to disengage it, you already feel it moving around, like back and forth, up and down, right to left. In in every it's loose in every dimension. And then when you pull it back, it takes very little to to make the blade come in, very little um, pull. So what I mean by that is distance of pull. So if you're going to use this knife, you have to use if you're going to have your thumb on the knife you have to be pushing the lock forward. It, you have to use the back of the lock as a thumb ramp. Otherwise, you know, my, my feeling is always to come up onto the blade. But if you, if you even just engage, if you pull back with your thumb even just a little, it disengages the blade. So it's, and it's not dangerous because I mean, unless you're unless it happens at high speeds with a lot of force, it's not dangerous because that flipper tab is there and it will stop the blade. But I mean, you know, annoying and slapdash approaching dangerous is how I feel about this recoil lock. I don't even know if they're making it anymore, um, but it seems like they could have avoided the whole thing just by asking some people. I I, I think I've seen like maybe two or three reviews of this lock and uh, no one no one was very psyched about it so uh, cjrb i know i'm late to the party but don't do it don't do it send me your next prototype for your next lock idea and let me see if uh, uh, let me see if i can save you some trouble because this this was a disaster in my opinion okay so what if this were a um a frame lock or not a frame lock but a uh, a liner lock Let's just pretend that this silly recoil lock isn't on it. Well, uh, ergonomically, I like the handle. The handle feels good. Um, I really actually rarely like a, a multi-finger choil, but this is so many fingers, it, it fills the hand nicely. Uh, it's very good in reverse grip if you happen to need that. The blade shape is actually really good. Reminds me a little bit of the CQC8 uh, clip point with a, with a sort of abrupt clip uh, Pretty thick and steep um, flat grind, but very sharp and seemingly slicey. I haven't really used this for anything. Uh, that's D2 blade steel. Pretty nice G10 uh, and, and you know, off the rack clip with giant screws that will mess with uh, deployment and with your pocket seams. So 
Uh, the bla- the whole thing is kind of a misstep. It's got some good qualities, but kind of a misstep. But the real problem is this terrible lock. Look, just a tiny bit, and it stops. Just a tiny bit, and that lock disengages. So hate it. Uh, recoil lock, hate. Um, but here, I'm going to go a little bit out of order. But here's a CJRB that I adore. I love it. I love this. CJRB, if, if, if you're listening or watching and you don't know it, who they are. They are the um, high value slash budget line for artisan cutlery. And um, this is the Scoria. I did a trade with Chris McNair on uh, on Thursday Night Knives. He, uh, I was talking about the Scoria and how I want one and how I kind of was late to that party. And I, I've always wanted one, never got one. He's like, hey, I have one for trade and it's your favorite, you know, black and maroon color combo. And uh well, he wanted me to, he said, name your price. And I said, how about we trade? So I traded him a riffle, a uh, great trade. And I love this thing. Uh, CJRB uh, is making their own proprietary steel called ARRPM9. And this is my first knife in that blade steel, ARRPM9. Uh, so far, it's very nice. Uh, it, it has sort of a toothy edge on it uh, at the moment. So it's very, very... Uh, it's an aggressive edge, a very aggressive looking um, drop point blade to me. And I think it's because, first of all, the tip is very close to center line. And then also it's got that nice, long, full length swedge. This is one that I wouldn't mind a little jimping on the back only for for tactile feedback. It feels good. Um, but this one does not have jimping. Great, great thumb stud that I find if I use the thumb stud to, to flick it open, sometimes I get interference with that flipper bar against the fat of my thumb. Um, it's not happening as much now that I've had it for you know a week or so, um, and I'm getting a little bit more used to uh, deploying it that way. But it's also a well-tuned flipper. Um, it's well-tuned for flipping and for thumb stud, um, meaning you can slow roll it easily um, you can flick it easily with either finger, you know, thumb or finger, and you can flip it. But know the, that when you have something set up for flipping and flicking, it's not going to be as good as a flipper. It's the 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 um, the detent just cannot be as stout as if it's just a flipper. But in this case, uh, you, can I make it fail? I can. Uh, but only if I, if it's fighting gravity. If it's not fighting gravity, I cannot make this knife fail. It's super smooth. Um, and I think it's incredibly good looking. It's got a, uh, a, a sculpted titanium clip here, a really nice micarta that is, uh, it's canvas, but it's contoured and kind of polished down. Nice standoffs. Everything about this knife at, I think it was $65. I think you can get these for $65 in a number of different flavors. And uh, this thing is awesome and well-deserving of all the hype it got when it when it came out back when. It's a, got a very uh, uh, usable finger choil, which I like a lot. And then that plunge grind is, and, and the termination of the edges in just the right place to, uh, to, to avoid hitting the thumb studs if you're using a um, consistent angle sharpener and such. And then lastly, I love how slender it is. Over the, the package overall is quite slender. The, the handle is contoured and, and it's slender and it makes it feel like a very, mm, well, it's a very slender knife. What can I say? And, and, but the contours, the outer profile of the handle really lock it in. It doesn't feel ever like uh, insufficient in hand. You could do a lot of hard work with this knife. Um, and and still feel comfortable. So uh, my dishing on the CJRB recoil lock, um, I did that first because that's the bad news. But the good news is that this CJRB, the Scoria, and all the other CJRBs I've experienced are outstanding. So every company deserves a misstep. Every well, every company uh, should be innovating. So that's a that's a a good thing to see. CJRB Scoria, thumbs up. All right. Uh, now I'll go to one that I was really interested in for a short burst of time and um, for a number of reasons. And it's the Real Steel. I do this every time. 
It's the steel will Scylla. Scylla is a uh, mythical beast from the Odyssey. He's uh, sh She is the six-headed um, kind of hydra-like thing that's hiding up in the caves and the rocks. And, uh, you know, when people say a rock in a hard place, uh, they're talking about, or that term originally comes from Odysseus having to make the decision. Do I go by uh, Charybdis, the giant sucking whirlpool that will destroy everyone on this ship? Or do I sail closer to, um, this is the Straits of Sicily, by the way, where my people come from. Or do I sail closer to Scylla, who will most definitely kill at least six of my guys? And uh, it's a hard decision to make. He decides Scylla because killing six is better than killing the whole ship. And yes, indeed, she comes down with her shrieking heads, with her giant dagger-like fangs, and 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 grabs ten or grabs six of Odysseus's finest men. Everyone who dies is always Odysseus's finest men. So, a uh, great part of that story. I love that story, and uh, I love Scylla. And my girls, that's like one of the first monsters I introduced them to. They love Scylla too. The knife I don't love. Uh, I was very interested in how it looked. Um, and this is this was coming, I feel, kind of right at the cresting, or no, uh, not the cresting, sort of the the popularizing of the front flipper. And but it kind of misses it's it's it kind of misses all boats here uh just keeping the the Scylla metaphor up it misses all boats because uh, as a front flipper you have to make you have to be very careful you got to make sure that every, with every way you're opening this you have to make sure that the fat of your thumb or the fat of your finger is avoiding this notch so you can front flip it you just have to have your hand cheated back okay you can slow roll it you just have to have your hand cheated back um, you can, uh, flick it like this, but still each time you have to have your hand kind of unnaturally cheated backwards to avoid this notch. So as you can see, the interest, the, the USP of this design is this right here. The extended tang with the thumb stud is supposed to do something other than look stylish. It does look cool. I must admit. And, and it, 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 it feels good to the thumb, reasonably good anyway. And uh, the way it's set up once it's open, it, it feels great in hand ergonomically. But this whole area here is a problem. Uh, it's just, you know, it's the sort of thing that if you were carrying this every day, if this were your EDC, you'd get used to it lickety split and it would, would not be a problem. But if you are a knife junkie, meaning you... <laughs> maybe you do several wardrobe changes per day with your knives or or you are at least rotating on a daily basis this is one of those knives that will catch you off guard and you will pinch your finger in there um so though it's cool it's another case of innovation that wasn't necessary and that kind of just flops um but cool name great blade shape really great blade shape i love that because you got your point uh, pretty much down the center line, which means that in any orientation, you know where the point is going to be on a thrust. Uh, and it is a, a gradual belly. And, the, and that tip is is in such a way that you could use it for a lot of uh, utility kind of tasks. The handle is comfortable, even though it looks a little bit jagged, like right here. It's really comfortable in hand. I mean, everything about this knife is actually pretty darn nice. That's... Uh, d2 steel it's even good it's even good in reverse grip everything about this knife like i said is pretty nice except this part that looks cool is actually not actually cool it's just first it's second kind of cool to quote nothing fancy first kind of cool is utilitarian cool second kind of cool uh according to nothing fancy is um looks cool is cool fun kind of good action that kind of thing uh, so yeah, second kind of cool, but, but not enough first kind of cool to make the steel will Scylla a, a hit. And I think that's why it kind of just fl floundered and flopped. Okay. Last year, I'm going to end this on a positive note. I finally got my hands on a Towser K by, uh, Kaiser and man, I love this thing. This is an Azo design and it came out to a lot of fanfare because it's, 
it's got some of the ingredients of like the Kaiser Sheepdog, for instance, but it's a little less extreme. Um, and in becoming a little less extreme, I think it's a little more useful. You, uh, they pull the the forward slope of the cleaver style blade. They pull that back a little bit, giving you much more of a tip than you get on the on the um, sheepdog. You get a nice curved belly there um, that is curved just enough for long, gradual cuts. Say you're cutting cardboard or stuff. That's all I've used this for, and I've used it quite a bit. Uh, for long cuts and stuff like that, you you have a ni nice enough belly to uh, to really pull the material in and to slice, um, and you've got a decent cutting edge length there. Um, so I, I really think that the blade shape for me is a um, an improvement on the Sheepdog. Now this isn't out there to compete with the Sheepdog because they're it's the same company. It's just it's there as another knife. But to me, I put them in the same camp. And I have never owned a sheepdog. I'd like them, but something about the point, I can't. I have a hard time owning knives without points um, or, or actively seeking them out. Um, this one uh, on the blade also has this jimped platform there, uh, similar to like a Finch Knives flipper tab, which is a, ends up being a jimped platform as opposed to a choil, but an area where you can choke, choke up to, to, um, to do finer finer you know work with that blade to get closer up to that blade uh an incredible fall shut action here this is the the polar opposite of what i was talking about early with the mekong delta combat folder from resco um, which requires constant pressure to close in a very gratifying way this it just requires a little bit of pressure on that flipper tab and it drops shut in a very gratifying way that's 154 cm steel. It's a got very nice cutting geometry. Uh, slicer. This is a slicer uh, to beat the band. It's got a very high flat grind. Um, and then I got the one with the rich light handles, not contoured. It's a flat slab of rich light. I got it because I love that thunder, thunderhead blue color, and it's got the um, it's got nice milling in it. And I just don't have any rich light. Rich light is kind of like a paper micarta. Uh, this also comes in a red contoured canvas micarta it was a very hard decision to make very hard first world decision to make <laughs> very hard knife junkie decision to make um there we go this thing is awesome i love it it was worth all of the hype um so that is the towser k from uh, kaiser knives and that does it for my late to the party knife reviews i have a feeling as i move forward and uh i've received so many cool knives lately on loan that are that have been around for a while that I never got my hands on. I might from time to time be doing some uh, late to the party knife reviews and maybe grouping them together. Uh, so, you know, just so I can get a lot, uh, make up for a lot of lost time. All right. Working the switcher, of course, is, is Jim. Uh, and we all thank you for your support. Uh, you can check us out here uh, by downloading us to the mobile apps, to the, um, podcast apps just to listen to these golden tones um, if I'm just too blindingly handsome to watch. And then uh, also be sure to go to Thursday Night Knives uh, uh, here on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook live 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every week. Join the conversation. Come on the screen and talk with me. Uh, it's been a few weeks since someone's done that. Uh, I always love doing that. Plus, we, we can get in a little knife debate we call a knife fight. That's always fun. Um, and then check out every Sunday here for a great interview. All right, for Jim, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.